Well, good morning. As we get ready to take some time and, and look into God's Word, would you uh, just join me? And, and I just want to take a minute, I want to pray, just ask the Holy Spirit to be with us in this time. Lord, we thank you uh, for the chance yet again to look into your Word. Lord, we thank you. It is, it is a privilege, it is a, a blessing to be able to come and, and take this time as a body of believers to grow, to be encouraged, and to draw closer to you. Holy Spirit, in this time, we ask that you would help our hearts to be open, to receive from your word. Um, show us even where you want to work on us and what you want to do. Lord, you are good. We give you the praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Yay, the slides are up. Good. All right, well, welcome to church. Um, I'm glad that the church is not about a building, but it's about the people. Uh, so our furnace broke down... Well, it sort of broke down. The upstairs furnace broke down on Friday. Um, so we're down here. But you know what? It's actually really good. I've really been enjoying it. Um, second week of 2024. And I just, I just wanted to, to ask you, are you expecting God to do great things this year? We've seen him work in 2023. He's working right now. And I truly believe he's got things he wants to do in 2024. And so my encouragement, if I can encourage you, is, is to um, look for what God is doing, but be open for him to use you. Um, we need to have willing hearts. So just a quick note on 2024 as I was thinking about it. Uh, most of you know I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, which is currently experiencing temperatures even lower than ours. Poor people. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> my parents still live in the house that I spent most of my childhood growing up in. Um, beautiful house, not really big, that big, just a one-story bungalow, finished basement, big backyard, two-car garage. I got a lot of memories in that garage. Uh, plenty of room outside. And the house was built in, in 1958. I'm sure when it was originally built, it was a beautiful house. But, but by the time my parents picked it up in 2003, it had fallen to the classification of fixer-upper. And I have a lot of memories throughout my childhood of uh, my dad particularly working on that house, countless hours, spending the time, getting it fixed up, uh, particularly in the basement. The basement was, was kind of a mess. It was a finished basement, with quotes. Um, my dad had a lot of work he had to do. And I think, if I remember right, it took them about 10 years before they could finally move everybody into the basement and it was done and really livable again. And my mom and dad have worked really hard. It's a beautiful house now. Uh, they've just poured a lot of time and effort and resources into it. But I remember it wasn't, it wasn't too long after we moved into the basement and dad had it done. Um, we started noticing some things. Some things were existing and they got worse. Other things kind of showed up. I remember uh, every time there was a big downpour, there was a crack in the foundation underneath the back stairs. And so water would start pouring in and, and, and just you'd end up with this puddle in the crawl space down there. And then it would just sit there and it wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, I remember also in the, in the laundry room on the south side of the house, we got mold on the foundation. So dad had to come in, take all the cabinets out and clean up all this mold put the cabinets back in. It looked really good when he was done, but it only took him like two months to figure it out. <laughs> I think the one that really stands out um, on the north side of the house, keep in mind this is a finished basement, so there's sub walls and stuff. The foundation formed a, a quite a massive crack. It started to leak. So my dad had to pull out this sub wall in my sister's bedroom and figure out how am I going to seal this huge crack. And it was really big. I think it spanned most of the length or the whatever the height of the uh, foundation and he got it figured out and I guess that's just the territory of old houses foundations crack you got to fix them that's the way things go but it took a lot of time took a lot of effort took a lot of resources on the part of my parents to fix this foundation but today they're reaping the benefits of that and that they the foundation as far as we know doesn't leak um, and the basement is, is whole, and the house itself is, is a nice house. And I bring this up this morning because, particularly in the month of December, and, and certainly before that, I was praying about, Lord, what do you, you want to do here in 2023? 
or it's 2024, 2023 is past. Um, where are you going? Where do you want us to go? Where are you taking us? And as I was praying about that and even uh, talking with some mentors in, in our district about that, I felt God really impress upon my heart that we need to spend time as a congregation working on our foundation. Not the foundation of this building, although I think it has cracks too, but that's fine. We're not worried about that. Um, but the foundation of, of this body of believers, what we believe, why we believe it, and, and from that, who is God shaping us into as part of the church, Christ's body? And so what we're going to do is we're, we're starting this new series. If you haven't noticed it from the giant word on your bulletins, it's, we've called it Foundations. And it's really, it's the foundations of our faith and the foundations of, of who we are as, as a church and what we believe. And what we're going to do, actually, is we're going to go through um, this document. And I've, we've got several copies over there if you'd like one. This is called the Statement of Essential Truths. And this is produced by our National Fellowship, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And what it does is it, it outlines what we believe and why we believe it. But I'm going to say this. This statement is not scripture. It simply outlines what we believe based on scripture. So what we're going to do together in the next four or five months is we're going to look at these statements and then we're going to tear apart scripture. We're going to look at these statements through the lens of scripture. And we're going to understand why we believe what we believe together. We're going to explore our core beliefs through the lens of scripture. I'm really excited for this series. I think it's going to be really good for us as a congregation to look at um, our foundation and to put work into the foundation of, of um, what God has done here in Leask. So today we're going to start, and, and I want to do a kind of a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at. I mean, I want to do that as much as possible in, in a story format. Um, Dr. Jeremy Martini, he is the president of Horizon College and Seminary. We ho heard from someone from, that, uh, from our college and seminary last week. He had this fantastic reminder um, when I watched something on, uh, on his thoughts on this statement. He said, our beliefs are a story that shape who we are and how we see the world. And he went on to say that we, we actually process the world in story. So today, what we're going to do is, is as we look at our foundations of belief, what shapes us and what helps us see the world, we're going to start with a story. All right, let's see, is this going to work? There we go. So the, the prologue, if you will, to this story is to get to know the triune God. Who is the triune God? Well, we believe there is one God who exists eternally in unity as three equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself, when, when he uh, gives the church, gives his apostles their commission, the great commission in Matthew 28, verse 19, he tells them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, as he's giving a, a blessing, to a benediction to the Corinthians, he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So we see in Scripture this demonstration of our triune God. One God who exists eternally in three equal persons. And often as Christians, um, our, our Jewish friends or maybe our, our Muslim friends can, can accuse us of worshiping three gods. And to that we would say, no, he's one God, but in three equal persons. And each person is fully God and fully united, fully one with each other. One God, connected, united, and yet distinct in three equal persons. If anyone is confused yet, that's very much okay. <laughs> We're going to, again, this is an overview. We're going to explore this more as we go. But the reality is, is that we are finite individuals worshiping an infinite God. 
we're never going to fully understand our God. But at the same time, we're going to explore Scripture and do our best to understand Him as much as we can. So that's the prologue. The prologue is that there is a triune God that we worship. But now we get into the story. The triune God gave us something. He gave us His Word. Why do we call it the Word? Well, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Whoop. There we go. 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We call it God's word because it is breathed out by God. And God has, God inspired different people throughout the ages to write different parts of the Bible that we now have. But it's not just human thought. It's not just human words. This is God's words. It's unlike anything else that we have. The whole Bible is the, rev the revelation of the triune God to humanity and to his people. So God gave us this, this beautiful gift in the Bible. And the Bible helps us to understand who he is and, and how we relate to him and how even how he made the world and who we are as humanity. So as we continue on in the story, we see that the triune God gives us the Bible and, and documents the story even of how he created the world. In seven days, God did his creating work. And everything was made by him, and he sustains everything. We see this at the beginning in Genesis 1. But I also want to look at the New Testament. Again, in Colossians verse 1, verses 16 and 17. And I'm behind on my slides. I'm very sorry. Oh, that's not even working. Okay. Um, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, talking specifically even about Jesus, says that, for by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or, or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God created our universe. Everything that we see, taste, touch, smell, that we know, our whole world was created by the triune God. And his word tells us that. But not only does it tell us um, how everything was created, but specifically our identity as human beings. If we look at Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Unlike the rest of creation, Humanity is made after the image of God. And again, as we go through, pause on the story for a second, as we go through this, we look at this in the next um, while together, we're going to explore just how foundational that truly is. But the creation account also details, not only does it detail who we are as human beings, but as human beings, the choice that we made to break God's moral law, to sin, and therefore not only estrange ourselves from God, but to chain ourselves to s sin and darkness. And so by the end of Genesis 3, we're three chapters into the Bible, by the way, that's it. Humanity has a massive problem. We cannot save ourselves. We need a savior. And this is where the next part of the story comes in, that the triune God who gave us the word, who created everything, also had a plan for salvation from the very beginning. Jesus Christ brought us out of slavery to sin. Salvation is available to all, and it is the redemptive act of the triune God. The life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ provides the way of salvation for all people. Perhaps the most well-known verse in all of Scripture is John 3.16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Likewise, 
Uh, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7, shows us this plan of salvation that God had. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, in other words, when God said, okay, now, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer slaves. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the redemptive act of the triune God, that he saved us when we could not save ourselves. And a part, as part of salvation, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for forgiveness, for reconciliation, both to God and to each other. We are born again. God replaces the heart of stone that we have, the, the heart, the dead heart within us with one that is alive in him. We're liberated from sin and darkness and we also gain empowerment to live like Christ every day, to become more like him every day. That's the redemptive act of the triune God. This leads us to the next part of the story. And it's particularly as a Pentecostal church, and as Pentecostals, we hold this as something that is core, and that is spirit baptism. And we see this first occurring at Pentecost. And Deb, the slides might be a little messed up, so I apologize. <laughs> In Acts 2-4, um, we read the account of what happens when the disciples in the upper room, after Jesus ascended to heaven, what happens when Jesus pours out his spirit upon them. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Just a few verses later in Acts 2, 33, we see Peter now empowered to witness, and he, he's telling the crowd about what has just happened. And he tells them about Jesus, and he says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured this out that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Spirit baptism provides a specific empowerment for witness. And the sign of, of speaking in tongues indicates that believers have been baptized with the Holy Spirit and has signified the nature of spirit baptism as empowering our communication to be his witnesses with speech and action as we continue to pray in the Spirit. I want to pause the story here for a moment because sp the idea of spirit baptism is something that not everybody agrees on. As Pentecostals, we hold it as something that's core, and yet even within our own fellowship, there's quite a bit of debate about how this works and what this is and what this looks like. So what I want to say is that we're going we're gonna to dive into that. We're going to look at that. We're going to get a handle on that. But sometimes there's a bit of a, a question of, well, are there two classes of Christians, those who are baptized in the Spirit and those who aren't? The answer is no. Whether you've spoken in tongues or you haven't, whether you've You've had this experience or you haven't. If you are saved, that's it. There you go. You're part of God's family. So I just want to say that, just so that we're aware of it as we continue forward, understanding that, that this is something that we want to explore, that we want to look at, that we want to get a handle on, but that it doesn't make you some sort of second-class Christian if you don't if you haven't experienced that. So just I just want to note that. Anyway, let's continue the story. So we have the Holy Spirit. The triune God has given us salvation. What happens? We are now uni united together under Jesus Christ as the head in his body, the church. The Spirit joins us together. As 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14 says, For just as one as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit you were all baptized into one body, 
Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Different denominations and, and fellowships have different focuses and strengths, but we all have one mission that Jesus Christ gave us. We've already looked at part of it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Those are Jesus' words to his followers just before he ascended back to heaven. So as people who are saved from sin and darkness and receive God's Holy Spirit, we are now together in Christ's body. And the church worships and prays and proclaims and disciples and fellowships together. Not only that, but the Spirit gives different gifts within the body. And each one of us here has a different gifting, something different that, that we bring to the table as part of Christ's body. 1 Corinthians, again, I've got lots of quotes from Corinthians. It's a good book. Um, 12, 4 through 11 says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but... It is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is part of what it means to be part of the church, that we each bring something to the table that God has empowered us with, has gifted us with. And the Spirit also empowers leaders within his church, male and female leaders, to lead his church under the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And that leads us to a final point in this story. As part of the church, we look forward with a lot of hope and a lot of anticipation to restoration. Because as as believers, we live in in what we're going to call an already, not yet. Already, we know the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We, are, we, we experience that benefit of salvation, but all the benefits of salvation, eternity with Jesus, perfected bodies, and, and, and many other things, we still eagerly wait for, but we have not realized all of it yet. And so we look forward with hope to restoration. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17 tells us that since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring him with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. That is our hope. And with restoration, we also look forward to God as judge because we know we serve the righteous and just judge scripture tells us that all will have to they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the je- and dead acts 10:42 says that 
he, that would be Jesus, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. That's the last chapter, the last part to the story. Restoration. And as we look out at our world and we see different things that are going on, things that we know don't honor God, we both look forward to the day when those things will no longer happen and when we will be with Jesus forever. And we also commit this world and its problems and, and those who are doing things that don't honor God to him because he is the righteous judge. There's a lot of hope in that. That is the, that's the main chapters of the story that we're going to look at together over the next few months. But we're also going to look at a few things, um, uh, some positions and some practices that come out of these, these core beliefs that as a, fellow, as a church we hold. So we're going to look at our perspective on marriage and family. We're going to look at, at how we view marriage and family. Actually, not how we view it, but how the Bible views it. Matthew 19, verse 6 says, and this is the words of Jesus, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let, no, uh, let not man separate. We know marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. It's not just a physical relationship, but it's this lifelong, permanent commitment. And it establishes an emotional and spiritual oneness. That's pretty amazing. We're going to look at that. We're going to understand why this is foundational and why we hold it near and dear. We're also going to look at a biblical perspective on divorce and remarriage. We're going to understand as a body where we stand on that, how to approach that with grace and with compassion. We're going to understand how re what, what the Bible says about remarriage, what me remarriage looks like, and how that works from a biblical perspective. We're also going to look at our perspective on gender because that's kind of a hot topic right now, <laughs> a very hot topic. And so as a church, we're going to look at a biblical perspective on gender. We're going to look at what God has to say about that. And we're going to take our cues from Scripture on how we, we answer the world and, and the world's um, perspective on gender. And finally, we're also going to look at the idea of tithing. Because tithing in the, in the Old Testament is this divine institution of God under the Old Covenant. It's compulsory. You give 10%. But as we come into the New Covenant, into the New Testament, we're, we're not bound necessarily by some of those same laws. But we see regular systematic giving taught in the New Testament. So we're going to look at tithing as well. We're going to understand, okay, what, it, what is tithing all about? Why do we give? How do we honor God with our finances? So tithing is, is kind of the last thing that we're going to look at as well. So that's a, probably doesn't feel like a very brief overview, or maybe too brief, I don't know. But that's what we're going to look at together. And we're going to take four or five months to do that. We're going to go through it a bit at a time, we're going to get a handle on these things. And I'm really excited for that because I think it's going to build a lot of unity here in our church. As we come to the end, I want you to think about this. God began a work here in Leask probably, I think, before any of us are even around. As I was kind of looking at the history for this church a while back, I, I read about um, some street meetings that got started here in Leask from believers in Parkside. And eventually they merged with this Hungarian Pentecostal church that I think was about 10 miles outside of the town in one direction or another. I can't remember which. And in 1952, God gave this assembly a permanent home here at 141 Railway Ave. And God has shown himself faithful. In 1977, God blessed this church with the ability to build our current facility because the old facility was quite a mess <laughs> from what I understand. And I think some of you will remember that. A lot of you could probably tell me 
in much more detail the faithfulness that God has exhibited to our assembly over the decades. I've been told that in the early 2000s, this church actually closed down for a little while. And God brought people along and he started this ministry back up. God is not done here in Leesk, in this church, with this body of believers. Our identity as well has always been Pentecostal. And we are blessed to be a part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, which is a national fellowship that, that um, keeps us accountable, that supports us, that gives us oversight. Not just this assembly, but, but me as well. So I don't run off the rails. The foundation that God has given us here as a body of believers is strong. And it's amazing. And we are building on the shoulders of giants, if you will. But I think it's time for us as an assembly to put a little bit of work into that foundation. Maybe to seal up some cracks. Maybe to deal with some some places where the foundation is a little weaker. What we're going to do in this next season is work on understanding what we believe, why we believe it, and the identity that God has given this specific assembly of believers as part of his universal church. And I will say this, we're not here to knock those who differ in their belief. Not at all. In fact, even within our own fellowship, there is some differentiation on belief on certain things. But what we're going to do is we're going to spend the time understanding who this church is and what God has called us to be. We're going to take time to to talk through some theology. We're going to work through scripture. And we're going to understand what it is that we believe and why we believe it. So here's my encouragement. As, as we embark on a journey together with this, I want to encourage you to really wrestle through the things that we talk about together every Sunday. To think about them for yourself and understand why, uh, what you believe and why you believe it. And if you come away from a, from a Sunday and you're like, I don't know what I think or I need to discuss that more or whatever, come and talk with me. I would love to talk with you. And the Bible says iron sharpens iron. So let's talk about it. But take the time to work together as a body of believers on understanding our foundation. Today is just a brief look at these these topics that we've been covering. We've looked at scripture in brief, and we've kind of been all the way through the Old Testament to the New Testament and back again in one morning. (laughs) But I hope you see how foundational these things are. I hope you you are willing to let the Holy Spirit do that work here and to be open even for him to point out areas where your foundation has some cracks and where it needs some work. My prayer is that as as a body of believers together, we will see unification from this, we will see strong faith from this, and we will see empowerment to go forward and be a light and a witness for Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. um, And I thank you for the time that we spent just overviewing what we're going to be looking at in your word. Lord, I firmly believe that you have placed us on this path and that you want to do foundational work. Holy Spirit, do that work in this place. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be open to hear what you are saying. That you would help us to be open to the work of building our foundation, of strengthening our foundation. And that's hard. It takes time. It takes effort. It can even hurt. God, I pray, I pray that you would go with us. God, I pray that from this, we would be a unified body of believers who reach out into this world that is lost and is hurting and needs you so badly. Use even this time. Use use the stuff that we're going to talk about to help us reach out. God, we thank you 
thank you that even though we cannot fully understand you, you have revealed yourself. And we get all eternity to spend time learning and growing in you. Thank you for your word. It is a gift to us. Thank you, God, for, for your creating work and that you continue to sustain. And that when we broke your law and we bound ourselves in sin and in chains, you came down and you paid the price and you set us free. Holy Spirit, thank you for being in us. Thank you for empowering us to live for Jesus. Thank you for empowering us to be witnesses. God, thank you for your church. And I pray that for all of us, we would hold your body near and dear. Lord, thank you that we get to be your children. And that through the Holy Spirit, we are bound to both Christ and each other. And Lord, finally, thank you for restoration, that we look forward with hope to what you are going to do at the end, that we have the ultimate hope, and even that we can leave the judgments and we can leave all this, this stuff that is wrong in the world with you. You're big enough to shoulder it, and you will make the right decision and judgment. God, as we go forward from this Sunday, I pray I pray that this body of believers uh, would be ready to engage with you. I pray that we would invite others along in this journey. Help us to reach out, even as you build our foundation. In Jesus' name, amen.